By the mid-1960s, the name of the game at Le Mans had become Beat Ferrari. And in 1966, there was a new strong challenger, the Ford GT. In 1966, Ford swept all before them and claimed a 1-2-3 at Le Mans. Ferrari had famously snubbed Ford's advances, and so Ford had turned up in their metaphorical backyard and kicked seven shades out of them. Although back in those days, they put it a bit more politely. First place, the number two Ford GT. Second place, the number one Ford GT. Third place, the number five Ford GT. An authoritative win for the American challengers. Fifty years later, Ford did it again with the new GT. Not an overall victory, but a convincing GTE class win. The car was developed behind closed doors by a tiny and dedicated team as race car first, road car second. But there had to be a road car, and it's built by Multimatic alongside the racer in Ontario, Canada. Let's collectively thank God for homologation rules. Now we get to try that road car on the public highway and of course on the racetrack. So this car was built to win Le Mans, but actually, now it's a road car. The competition, if anything, is even fiercer. In recent memory, we've had some of the best cars ever, Speciale, LT. Now we've got the 720S, the 488, which have just taken the performance up another level. So for this thing to walk in and be the supercar benchmark, that is a hell of a tough job. The motorsport roots of this car, they really shine through. And initially, that's just from the noise. This car makes so much noise. There's engine noise, there's noise of hydraulic spoilers going up and down. You touch the brakes and you hear it through the pedal, you get all this ceramic brake noise. It's just a cacophony this thing makes, it's unbelievable. So what's creating this aural assault? Well, rather controversially, the GT's engine is a 3.5 litre twin turbocharged V6 EcoBoost engine. It might produce 647 horsepower and 550 foot-pounds and feature an anti-lag system, but it shares 60% of its parts with the F150 Raptor pickup. It's hooked up to a seven-speed dual-clutch transmission. The chassis is all carbon fibre with an innovative integrated roll cage. Suspension features unequal length double wishbones all round with inboard pushrod operated springs and dampers and hydraulically actuated ride height control. There are five drive modes and when you select track the ride height drops from 120 to 70 millimetres, the spring rate doubles and the active aero goes into its maximum downfall setting. The GT weighs 1385 kilos dry. Brakes are carbon ceramic, tyres are Michelin Cup 2s, the tiny, almost Lotus Elise-like interior space features fixed seats but an adjustable pedal box, and the squared off steering wheel has buttons and rotary dials to control pretty much everything. It's a unique environment and those killer flying buttresses, which are hollow and feed the engine with cool air, look amazing in the mirrors. So that's the detail, but how does it feel? So what's the dynamic experience like beneath that noise? Well, it's quite a thing to work out actually. Initially, the drivetrain, it is noisy, but it's not a supercar great drivetrain. There's something quite appealing about it. It's got this real race car vibe. There's just so many weird and wonderful sounds, but it's not tuneful. It doesn't sing, this car. Because the engine isn't a really 
super precise, super aggressive motor. That means the gearbox doesn't have the absolute pop that you get with the best from, say, Ferrari. It's quick, it's good, but the drivetrain is not really what defines this car. I like the Le Mans spirit, but really this car's about the chassis. What is surprising, the ride is actually really good. There's a comfort setting, but we don't need it on this road, and this road's pretty bumpy in places. But it's the mechanical grip that the car's got. Now, initially, that makes the car feel quite aloof. It's like the car's super stiff beneath you, and you're up here somewhere trying to understand what it's doing. But with time, you sort of relax into it, and you start to trust the front end, and then you find that there's grip and composure. It's actually really nice the way it flows along the road. Hardly any understeer, and then just this nice bit of oversteer on corner exit. There's a traction control system, and if you go for advanced track, I think it's called, which is sort of a halfway house eh? that's wicked. That's like a proper race car setup. It allows slip, trims it really neatly. It feels like it's not in trim at all, which is, I guess, the key to a really good system. There's balance, and just so much grip and composure. What it doesn't have is that incredible playfulness of the Speciale. That was their initial benchmark car. And somehow it doesn't communicate quite as clearly as that. It doesn't give you so many options. But it's, it's really, it has got that race car vibe going on. It's uncompromising, noisy, but still works on the road. It's an impressive thing, but it does feel restricted out here. I think we need to take it on the racetrack and see what all this aero and all this grip, all this noise adds up to in its real home environment. The team behind the GT are very keen we try it on the track too, so they laid on some time at the Utah Motorsports Campus. Slightly pretentious name, but a fantastic place to experience the GT, somewhere closer to its amazingly high limits. Okay, so I've done my laps uh, in this crazy thing. We did two sighting laps, five proper laps. Um, quite a thing to try and get your head around. It's a wicked track, I have to say. But the car in track mode is actually really cool. It's got this lovely feeling that the front is completely pinned. Uh, it, it's so low at the front, I guess, and there's, there's the downforce. They talk about the downforce being balanced, but it feels just like the front wants to turn always, and the rear is just moving behind it. So you don't even have to disable the traction control because it's always seems to be just on the edge. It's really, really nice feeling. The engine actually works pretty well on the track. It feels, weirdly, it feels quicker on the track than it did on the road. Uh, the, like I said, traction control is really good. Just occasionally you're on the power and the engine goes flat, and you're like, what's going on, what's going on? And then you realise it's the traction, and as you open the steering, bang, you get the full effect. Um, but yeah, just, it's not a toy, it's not a car you just want to slide around and have fun in. It's, you, you find yourself thinking, okay, where should I brake? Where do I turn in? How can I be earlier on the throttle? So it makes you want to drive better, I guess, which is more like a racing car than a road car. I think that's where the racing car DNA comes in. It just makes you want to attack and be cleaner and more precise. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. <laughs> Not as cool as this one, though. So this one came second at Le Mans in 66. That is just about perfect. It'd be even better if the engine ran, obviously, but... And just like that, our time with the GT is over. It's an intense car and it makes you want to up your game to match its abilities, and on track it really works. But what's great for endurance racing, specifically a smaller engine for efficiency and aero packaging, doesn't necessarily translate to a road-going supercar. 
The drivetrain just isn't special enough and at twice the price maybe more of cars like the 488, 720S and Huracan Performante, that's a hard thing to overlook. I still really want one, but I don't think I'd climb over a Speciale or 675LT to get into it.